Welcome to the Way Out Recovery Hour, and happy Monday to everyone. I'm Bob Sheritz, and um, we are rolling into, we're, we are um, way into 2019 by now. Now that we're, now that we're well into 2019, uh, I'd like to uh, probably for the last time wish everyone uh, a happy new year until next year. Um, welcome and a to a, a grateful Monday show. I'm going to start off the way I do just about every Monday by offering you an opportunity uh, to change your perspective, unless, of course, you don't need a perspective change. Uh, but a lot of people go into Mondays thinking, oh, my, here we go. We got this, you know, big daunting week in front of us with all this stuff to do and and here's the uh here's the offering of a new perspective let's take a moment right now to just sit and think about all the wonderful opportunities that we may face this week. All of the challenges that we get to work through, all the people that we get to help, all the amazing uh, conversations that we're going to have and the interactions that we're going to have uh, with other human beings in front of us. And let's not just limit it to human beings and pets as well. And just think about uh, all the things that we have to be grateful for and all the wonderful opportunities in our lives. Um, you know, I like to start off that way. I like to start off that my day every day that way by taking a moment to really get grateful. You know, um, in the world of addiction, uh, for anybody who's in recovery, one of the beautiful things about being in the recovery process is it doesn't take much to get grateful. All I got to do is sit and think about uh, what it was like to be stuck in that spot where I felt like there was no way out. And here we are on the other side of that. And and um, and uh, it doesn't take much to get grateful. It doesn't take much to put that in perspective. Um, we are the Way Out Recovery. We are an intensive outpatient program located on the corner of Plum Canyon and Bouquet Canyon. Our physical address is 28118 Bouquet Canyon. Uh, please drop by any time and pay us a visit. You know, it's cool. I said that last week, and I got back to the office about an hour and a half from now, and there was a lady who came in, and I had the opportunity to sit and have this really cool conversation um, with this young woman uh, for about an hour and a half, and it was, it was because she was listening to the show and heard me say, drop on by um, we would love to see anybody who drops on by give us a call especially if you or a loved one needs help um, you know if you're sitting out there and you're suffering with any mental health issues or substance abuse issues or anything that is in that world uh, you know in those in those the world of those issues right there please give us a call you know Asking for help is absolutely the first step, and um, you know it might be the most important phone call you make uh, to six six one two nine six four 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 four. Uh, visit our website at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. You can also submit a request for a personalized assessment on there, or if you have any questions about anything that you're going through or about our program, uh, there's also a way to communicate with us on that website as well. Again, um, thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. You can always shoot me an email directly at bob at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. But again, you know, the point of this is is that if you or a loved one is suffering um, ask somebody for help you know if you don't want to call us call somebody ask your neighbor ask a loved one ask your clergyman your pastor your teacher uh, you know whatever you're going through you do not have to go through alone and um, and the recovery process is available we live in a time right now yes we do live in a time where drugs are more are stronger and more available and and more people are using than any other time in history However, we also live in a time where treatment is more accessible, more available, easier to get to, um, and it is more effective than it's ever been in the history of time as well. So, um, you know, if you're out there struggling or suffering, there's no need to do that anymore. So we have an incredible show lined up for us today. Um, you know, sit back and relax. Uh, we are in studio today with one of my favorite people in the world. I don't want to offend anybody or I 
I would say the most favorite person in the world, uh, Brenda Way, who's also a ma- marriage family therapist, and she's also our clinical director um, over at The Way Out. Welcome to the show, Brenda. Thanks, Bob. We are going to uh, tap into Brenda's expertise today as well as, you know, um, uh, talk about our own recovery process. I don't think that Brenda minds, and if she does, too late because I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I don't mind. I, th- <laughs> I don't think that Brenda minds that I say that she and I have been going through the recovery process together, and we have also, you know, we've both been clean and sober for about the same amount of time, uh, which is over a decade. Coming up on 15 years, it's getting closer to 15 years Very now, close. and um, and what a wonderful journey we have been experiencing together, Brendan. I'm really grateful that you're in my life, um, certainly personally, um, but also professionally as well. I've watched you grow over the years, and um, not that you weren't a um, careful. Uh, I was going to say like a school nerd <laughs> or a person who loved education prior to, um, you know, getting into the field of uh, of helping people and uh, counseling and therapy and all of that stuff. Well, I loved education. I just unfortunately also loved drugs and alcohol. And so they get in the way of each other, don't they? they right? Do. Yeah. One of the things about addiction is that it unfortunately, um, you know, pushes everything else out of our life. And no matter how much we love something. Uh, it seems that uh, we can't access it when we're in the throes of addiction. So it takes a back seat. It does take a back seat. So we have a wonderful show lined up for you today. Um, you know, a couple of questions that we're going to answer after this break. Uh, you know, uh, uh, be sure to tune back in. You know, anytime I want to say something about the show in general. I don't know how you're listening today, whether you are on AM 1220, FM 98.1, if you're on the KHTS Facebook page watching live, if you're on the Way Out Recovery Facebook page watching live or if you're going to access this later on through the YouTube channel or through our website or through KHTS website or um, or uh, any of the other means Um, but let your friends know about this you know we're on every Monday and we do stream live on Facebook and so it's a great opportunity um, for you to sit back and get some uh, really good information about, you know, addiction and mental health and um, and those types of issues in general. And even more so, what we talk about here is we talk about recovery. And we're going to offer you some tips on how you can get in touch with your emotions and your actions behind those emotions so that we can act better, thus feel better, thus do better. So when we come back, we have a really rocking show in store for you and Brendan and I are going to get into um, just what emotions are and feelings are and um, and how we can sort of you know get a hold of those and um, in, embrace them and love them and feel them right and feel them and feel them because so, they're not an option Brenda Way and Bob Sherritt's on the Way Out Recovery Hour we will be right back after this break Welcome back to the Way Out Recovery Hour. I'm Bob Sheritz, and I am in studio today uh, with a very special friend of mine. She is also our clinical director and a marriage family therapist, uh, Brenda Way. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Bob. And, uh, you know, you and I, uh, you and I talk a lot, but this last week, a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of what happens for me in the groups that I run and in the people that I work with is I sort of get, I don't want to say stuck, but I sort of get in these, in these streams of, um, of like a t- certain topic. And one of the things that keeps coming up in a lot of the groups is uh, people will share with me, I, you know, I get so frustrated or I get so sad or I get so um, ashamed that I do things that I regret doing later on. And so a couple of weeks ago, I think I gave you a call and I said, hey, you know, the topic of emotions and um, what we do with our emotions and and how those uh, sort of, uh, you know, can can cripple us if we're not paying attention to them keeps coming up. Why don't we do a show? And I said, that's a great idea. <laughs> and Brenda said, that's a great idea. I love I love the opportunity to um, talk about those things. I want to start off by by simply saying this, that as we go through this show, I want people to understand that we are not in any way saying that um, feelings are not good or bad 
Right. They're neutral. That they just are. But when we do this show and when we give this information, what we are not saying is, is it's not okay to feel these feelings. There's sort of a um, saying that goes around the rooms of recovery that is really, really true, but it's whatever. It's, um, you know, the best thing about being clean and sober is... You get to feel. And the worst thing about being clean and sober is... You get to feel. <laughs> right? And so we get to feel our feelings these days. Just for the purpose of what we are talking about... God, there must be a million feelings, right, Brenda? I, I would say maybe about a million and two. <laughs> a million and two feelings. Yeah. How many feelings are there really, just for clarification purposes? I try to boil it. But, hi, I try to boil it down to about five. And I would, and and um, that's what I've heard as well. There are five feelings. And five basic emotions. Five basic emotions. Joy, anger, <clears throat> sadness, shame, and sadness. Fear. Fear. Sad, mad, wait, let's do this. I think you said sadness twice. Here's how I remember it. Mad, sad, glad, afraid, ashamed. Mad, sad, glad, afraid, ashamed. I want to go through those and ask you and maybe open up a discussion right now. Feelings are purposeful, correct? Absolutely. They all serve a purpose. We're supposed to have them. Yes. So let's go down the list and kind of look at what the – and when, we, when I say purposeful – um, you know, I, I've had to look outside of myself in my recovery process to see what healthy looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have the best model growing up for what healthy looked like, um, which a lot of people in addiction, you know, grow, it's it sort of can become multi-generational and, and, you know, and we model whatever, you know, we grow up in a lot of times. And so, a lot of people that we work with don't oftentimes have a like a starting point for healthy. Right. So when we talk about what the purpose of feelings are, I want to say that this is from the perspective of a healthy human being. That's fair. Okay. So sad. What's the purpose of being sad? What is the, because I don't, you know, I don't want to feel sad. And, and what happens for me is if I'm going through loss or rejection or something that makes me that, that, that I'm sad about, I tend to want to push people away and go to like anger or something. I want to, it's, it's a weird thing is I don't want to feel sad. What is the purpose of me feeling that way? I think that <laughs> sadness teaches us what's valuable. If I'm experiencing some level of sadness, I may have suffered a recent disconnection. I might not be connecting properly to something that's actually there. It's a way for me to gauge if I am connected to something that's healthy for me. Well, and, and, you know, I always, so when I think of sadness, I automatically think of loss, right? And I right. think that there are... Um, some really powerful rituals in the world, maybe around mourning and around loss and around death and around things like that, yeah. that allow us to have sort of a, a processing time in sadness. I know that there are some religions that, you know, there's a period of mourning. Yeah. Uh, afterwards where uh, where a person sometimes doesn't interact you know i've seen some cultures where um where there's a long period of mourning even up to like six months where a person isn't even allowed to necessarily partake in things that might distract them from feeling the feelings right so, go ahead it, it, it's the reason we have funerals memorial services it, it's an opportunity to go and experience this sadness in a healthy way because it's appropriate to feel sad when we've disconnected from someone or something that we love. Right. It's almost like, so, so in terms of health, if I experience a loss or a breakup or something like that, um, you know, for me to sit, I, I think sadness and I, and maybe this is the same thing you just said. I think sadness is a really good opportunity and, uh, for us to reflect. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, because it's really introspective. Well, think about what happens if I can't experience the sadness in a healthy way. If I feel like I'm not supposed to feel sad, or if I'm so disconcerted by feeling sad that I feel like I have to change it, Right. what are you likely to do? 
And sometimes, well, I, I already stated, I'm likely to go to mad or cut off or disconnect or maybe right. even apathy, right? Right. Or I'm just like, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it or something, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. If I'm feeling sad, you know, I can appropriately say, hey, I need some time. Yeah. Cool. But the difference in that is when it can become, dare I say, pathological is when I experience something that is, and I'm sitting in sadness, and maybe I've got this internal story that says you shouldn't feel this way, or maybe there's an external message that I've grown up with that says, like, men don't cry or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. or, you know, buck it up, or, or whatever that looks like, okay. um, and so I shut that feeling down and I push people away, that can, that can sort, of, sort of fester and turn into something else, right? It, that's exactly what it does do. And you, you talked about if I think that I'm not supposed to, you know, and, and I think it's important to be able to acknowledge how emotions hook into our thoughts. And we, something that we had a mutual instructor that used to say, are you working this out or are you acting this out? I can act out my emotions without really thinking about them because I think this is what I'm supposed to do when I'm sad. Right. So sad, mad. Mad feels, now, again, you know, these are all, emotions are healthy and they're something that we're supposed to feel. Mad feels powerful to me sometimes. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a generator. It turns on some kind of fire in me when I feel powerless. Right. So anger is, you know, anger is interesting. Anger is a secondary emotion. That's correct. What do I mean by that? Secondary means it does not come up first. So I can't just be mad. <laughs> we can get into a habit and we can't trace back where the mad comes from, but something has happened first. Something in my environment has made me feel vulnerable or at risk, or somehow in harm's way. So on a physiological level, you know, MAD is my body's ability to prepare itself for fight or flight. Yeah, it's protective. So that means it comes on the tail end of fear? Most of the time, it'll be fear. And fear is kind of tricky, because if I'm sad and I'm not supposed to feel sad, that can make me feel afraid. Right. And so anger is easy. Oh, and, it, you know, and, and, uh, and we will certainly get into that, how, you know, um, feelings are not always selective. What I mean by that is I'm not generally feeling one feeling. Uh, right. And so we want to be able to, uh, to identify and understand what we're feeling. So, so mad is purposeful in, in a protective way. It can save my life. Yes. In many different ways. I can run, I can fight, I can, you know, whatever. Right. right. Um, yeah. Um, glad. Happy. We all want to feel that's happy. That's the target. That's the one, right? Right. It's the that's only the one, one that's okay with us. Well, it's well. Interestingly enough, though, is um, you know, if when people come into the recovery process, oftentimes I will ask them, you know, what's your goal? So we do goal setting and we do treatment planning and we do all that stuff. And a lot of people say, I just want to be happy. Mm -hmm. And what an unrealistic idea is that? I well, want to be happy all the time. Right. To be happy all the time. Yeah. Right. Like that's not the way it works. Right. Is is we're not doing that. And one of the things, and this is not, um, you know, maybe I'm bursting people's bubble when I say this, but I like to do, a, you know, I'm very real in the counseling that I do. And I say, great, you may end up with periods of happiness. I can almost guarantee you, in fact, I can guarantee you that you will end up with periods of happiness. But the goal in recovery is to stop the behavior. Yeah. The goal in recovery is to be sober, right? The goal in recovery is to be abstinent. The goal in recovery is to not have these problems that I have that are caused by the drugs. And so if we make that our primary goal, then happiness seems to come along with that, right? It does. And just emotionally speaking in the recovery process, if I can learn to be okay with whatever I'm feeling, what I might find at the end of the day is some inner peace, right. some point of serenity. Well, and serenity is an interesting thing. That inner peace that you talk about, you know, serenity, a, a feeling of calmness is not, does not mean that everything is hunky dory and peachy in my life. Absolutely. It means that no matter what comes down the line, I can be okay with it. That's right. You know, and that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be appropriately sad or appropriately angry or appropriately whatever. It just means that, that I can still feel those feelings and I don't, it doesn't have to, um, how was it put? The quality of my life does not have to be dependent 
upon anything else that's going on around me. Yep. Other people, other circumstances, whatever. My quality of life can be can be okay in any circumstance, you know? Exactly. Interesting thing about glad or happy or happiness is statistically speaking, more people in the recovery process from addiction will relapse in times of good seemingly that is than true. in times of bad isn't that, that is interesting true. right yeah like we can handle crisis and chaos and all that stuff we're kind of used to it you know that's the life of addiction oftentimes but when things are going good you know if i've made that my goal in the recovery process then i think well i'm doing great i, I could be just a little more great right. i could be just a little bit happier and wouldn't this help Oftentimes, in, and this is not just, so here's a commonality in mental health issues as well. Oftentimes, one of the most frustrating things in the world of mental health is, um, is finding what works for each person because each person is not the same. So whatever, sort, whatever therapeutic or behavioral methods I use to make myself, um, to allow myself to feel differently than my depression or my anxiety or whatever, combined with sometimes different medications, whatever that combination looks like, Sometimes it can take people years to find what works for each person. And then they will find that formula. And one of the things that's really frustrating from a provider's standpoint or from a loved one's standpoint is to watch people get to a point where they're doing really good and then they get this thought, which is the same thing that happens in addiction recovery, is I'm doing so good right now. I feel so good. I probably don't need that medication anymore. Right. And that's a story that gets a lot of people in trouble is I'm feeling so good. I stopped taking the medication. And before I know it, I'm back in that deep, dark hole and didn't know how I got there. One other idea of sadness is we think that it's the target. But I know there was a point in my life about 15 years ago that if I did feel happy, it was a little scary. Right. It, it felt like something too delicate that I, it would just shatter. Like at the any other moment. shoe's going to drop that's any exactly time, right? Right. right. Yeah. And then, and that happens, that same commonality happens in addiction recovery too, as you see many people, they, when they first get into the recovery process for whatever reason, and it doesn't matter what gets you into recovery. You know, um, there's a myth out there that says that I have to want it in order for mm. it to work. And that is not the truth. No. I have to be exposed to it in order for it to work. So if you got to push your loved one into treatment, cool, push them into treatment. If you're walking in the door because you don't want to go to jail or you don't want to lose your kids or you don't want to lose your job or your wife or your husband or whatever, right on. It doesn't matter. This is not my idea. I just want to get the heat off. Cool. Welcome. Come on in our door. Yeah. You know, if I'm exposed to it, then I may get the message. But what happens for a lot of people is they'll come in for whatever reason and they'll throw themselves in. I'm willing to do anything to stay sober or to not go to jail or to get my wife back or my kids back or whatever. So they'll go to tons of meetings and they'll sponsorship and 12 steps and all this different stuff. And six months from now or nine months from now or a year from now when every, when all the dust settles and everything's cool and I start feeling happy and I start feeling good, I start thinking, man, I don't need to do all that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And I stop taking, dare I say, my medicine. Uh-huh which is the meetings and the sponsorship and the steps and the ongoing recovery and all the many things that we do and just the commonality, you know, and oftentimes a person is suffering from both mental health and, you know, um, almost half of the people that come in sure. statistically are, um, co-occurring disorders. You know, they have multiple things going on. Um, sad, mad, glad, afraid. What's the purpose of fear? Bob? What is the purpose of fear? <laughs> Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> it tells us what to be cautious of. God, it saves it, our life, right? It does. It saves our life. Yeah. It's protective. And it, you know, where we get twisted, and I think, um, maybe we'll get into this, but I, I mean, the, the statement is this, is that um, people in the world of addiction and mental health and recovery, uh, more often than not, it seems that we are highly sensitive people like we feel more deeply we're hurt more deeply that sort of thing right intensely yeah. yeah and so we experience joy more deeply as well but oftentimes what can happen is if i'm that overly sensitive person and that's not a criticism you know to be sensitive mm -hmm. is it does it's not a good or a bad thing it just is it right? just is i can be afraid and there can and uh, you know, a good friend of ours says that almost all of my problems start with a fear. You know, I am afraid and I build a story around it. That's right. 
And so fear, you know, to have a healthy fear of dying from drugs, it can be a really beneficial thing, right? Like I can use that to not do drugs or many of the other risky behaviors that we get into. And many people respond very well from, you know, show them pictures of what can happen to them if they keep doing what they're doing. And there are many people who will go, oh, my God, I never knew it could be that bad. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And then there are there's a percentage of people who who are that kind of fear is so debilitating looking at that stuff that the only way that I can stop it is to do more drugs. And so for some people that doesn't work necessarily, you know, Um, but we can take that fear. And we can turn it into this big, huge thing and build stories around it, and pretty soon we're off and running, right? Well, and in the story, there was a point in our evolution where the thing to be afraid of was to be extricated from the group, left for dead, or uh, of the wild, right? I I was afraid of the tiger that might jump out of a tree and eat me while I was taking a bath. But we've come to a point in our evolution where those physical threats are still real, But it's not primary. Our fear comes down to what are people thinking of me? Am I going to look silly? Am I going to be able to do this okay? What's going to happen tomorrow? And that gets out of control. And when you say, you know, and we work... Um, we work a lot with teenagers as well. And not certainly this is not exclusive to teenagers. I think that just the... um, uh, we do a better job maybe at hiding it or get more creative the older we get. But you just mentioned something. I'm afraid of what people will think. You know, I don't know that it was worse or better uh, before the advent of social media, but it sure is very <laughs> much in our face now, right? Yes, it is constantly. People are very concerned about how many thumbs up they get or how many thumbs down they get or mm-hmm. or how many people are watching or looking or commenting in a positive way, you know. And I think that because of um, the way that we interact and communicate with each other, we certainly have a lot more um, bullying and uh, sensitivity to that nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. But when you said, I'm afraid of what people think of me, this is where f- this is where fear blends into our last one, which is shame, right? That is right. Shame is the one emotion that I, there's no documentation, but I am of the opinion shame is the only emotion we're not born with. We have to teach each other how to be ashamed. Yeah, we, um, yeah, right. Because when you're a kid and you fall over, you don't get that flush of, oh my God, I hope nobody saw me, Mm -hmm. embarrassment, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What is, um, just as a little side note, um, you know, one of uh, anybody listening, if you want to listen to someone or watch somebody, check out Brene Brown's work. Mm -hmm. Brene Brown is a shame researcher who's done many videos and talks and stuff. She does some really excellent work around shame and the idea of shame. John Bradshaw is another you know uh, person yeah absolutely um claudia black has Mm -hmm. a lot of talks on on shame so there's a lot of stuff out there if you want to know more about how shame works and how it can really debilitate us if we're not careful but shame is purposeful it teaches us how to correct behavior right and the difference you know i i will oftentimes use this in our uh in our groups you know um if i here's my prop right? Here's my bottle of water prop. If I walk into the room and I kick the bottle over and I spill the cup, shame is a warm wash that comes over me. And I look around and I say, Oh, I hope nobody saw this. And what healthy shame says is I'll have to be more careful next time. Mm -hmm. Clean it up, put some more water in the cup and okay. Be careful next time. If I have chronically unhealthy shame and I've been beating myself up or I've had those messages that say you're stupid, you're bad, you're a mistake, you're all that stuff, whether that's internal, external, or both, here's a good a good sort of barometer for whether or not you carry that around. If I walk in the room and I kick that cup over and my reaction is, oh, Bob, you're such an idiot. Mm-hmm. Why do you always do that? Mm-hmm. And you turn and walk out of, the, you know, out of the room with that. If I'm continually beating myself up and, and, and going, God, you're such an idiot, Bob. Right. That is the message of unhealthy shame, and that's There's not the There's no purpose. room for growth. There's right. no ability to do anything different. This is what you're stuck with, and it's what it's always going to be. And so shame is absolutely purposeful, you know, and, and we go through that because I want people to understand, and those are the five feelings, sad, mad, glad, afraid, ashamed. Everything else fits in that category, right? And if we can learn to identify those feelings, if we can learn that those are, like, where am I at right now? 
that can be beneficial to us. Feelings are neither good nor bad, would you say? That they're neutral. It's what we make of them that makes them feel good or bad. You ever Have you ever um, studied any kind of mindfulness practice or do you participate in that yourself? I do. How can that help with me identifying my feelings? Being mindful. If I can step back from what I'm thinking, because my thoughts go out of control and it hooks my emotions and it pulls me along. If I can take a step back from the story that I create about what I'm experiencing, I might have an opportunity to stand still long enough to say, what am I, what am I feeling? My heart's beating a little faster. My breathing's changed. Maybe my stomach is fluttering a bit. What am I experiencing? If I can stop the story for just five seconds, there's an opportunity for me in that window to be able to have a different perception. So mindfulness practice is often done with a period of meditation, correct? Correct. So, you know, I don't know what people's thoughts about meditation are. There's no wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. There are many, I suppose, right ways to do it, but there's no <laughs> wrong way to do it. Um, but it really is just having a time to sit. Well, and, and here's, an, here's what I do regularly. I, I will sit, yes, but I can also... I can do my dishes mindfully. Can, can I stop everything that I'm thinking and just listen to the water run? Right. Can I feel the food the on the dishes? Yeah, the temperature and of the water in my hands. Exactly. Or... Can I just pay attention to the sensations? It stops the story. Studies suggest that if you do something like that for, for at least eight minutes, but I would say anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, once you get... There's not a whole lot of studies that say if you do it for longer than 20 minutes that it's more beneficial than actually doing it for 10 minutes, right? right? But if you can sit purposefully and pay attention to what's going on for 10 minutes a day, what happens is the physiology of the brain changes and you start to it starts to become a regular practice, which now as I'm going through my life, when I feel something or experience something, I, my brain is already tuned to don't get attached to it. Yes, it becomes second nature to let things drift by. It was really neat when I, so I was I used to sit in this um, in this regular practice of meditation with a group, and the guy was talking a good friend of mine, Gary Sanders, um, used to come out here and he would run. Uh, it was SCV Mindful Meditation Group, right? And um, I don't know if Gary's watching this or listening to it, but I'm, I hope everything's going good up there in Portland. I know you're rocking it with your meditation groups and everything. Um, but Gary taught me a lot, and he was sitting there one time talking to us about what our ideas about meditation were. And he said that as we sit there, right, like try to sit there and just pay attention to the breathing or whatever's going on, your breath. And when I catch myself in a story, when I catch myself grabbing hold of uh, my schedule for the week or what I have to do later on or, oh, I made that mistake last night, when I catch myself in that story and I realize that I'm doing it and I pull myself back to my breath, that moment right there is the meditation. Yeah. That and if I have to do that a thousand times in a 10 minute period, so be it, so be it. Cause what happens is I learn, Oh, to, uh, to, to disengage from that idea. Right. And he described it as being as sitting and watching the clouds go by. Right. Sometimes it's going to be stormy and sometimes it's going to be sunny and sometimes, but we just watch the clouds go by. We don't get into, Oh my God, everything's going to go crazy because there's a dark cloud on the horizon. Right. And when we can catch ourselves doing that, it allows us to detach from getting caught up in the story. Yes. Which is, you know, which is, um, really at the heart of the problem, I suppose we'll call it a problem in the issues around mental health and addiction. You know, the, the, sure, certainly the drugs and the alcohol and the stuff that happens are a problem in and of themselves, but there's a commonality that runs through. So here's a spectrum of addiction. When I say process addictions, what am I talking about, Brenda? A process addiction is something like shopping or overeating. Well, maybe not the eating, but the shopping. I like I like the feeling of walking into a store and finding that good buy and purchasing it and walking out with this new thing. That's a process. So it gets the it gets the same neurotransmitters going inside of my brain that mm -hmm. I get from drugs, right? So uh, other process addictions are things like um, sex can be in there. Shopping, mm -hmm. you mentioned. Gambling. Um, gambling is in the process addiction. Um, I can be addicted to my feelings. 
that codependency and and relationships, workaholism. Mm-hmm. Interesting, you mentioned food. Food kind of fits in both categories. It does because it is certainly a you know eating There's disorders. There's some ritual when it yeah. comes to food. Eating disorders are the process, but yeah. there are drugs in food as well, right. right? If it wasn't for salt, sugar, and fat. All the fast food places would probably close down tomorrow, right? That's the drug. Yeah, that's I mean, the that's drug. why we that's why we attach to those. And then there, of course, there are those substance addictions, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a commonality that runs through all of those. There's a reason that we get addicted to that stuff. And um, the reason what is the reason, Brenda? Because I cannot tolerate my feelings. Right. They're too big. I don't know what to do with them and I can't just sit with them. And so I have to change them somehow. If I feel bad. I don't know what bad is. I just don't like it. And so if I become engaged in this addiction, whether it's process or substance, I don't feel it anymore. It changes. So I don't want to feel the way that I'm feeling right now. You know, for the, um, for the drug user, that's pretty obvious. Yeah. You know, I inject the drug or I snort the drug or I smoke the drug or I drink the drug or whatever. And within, you know, within sometimes seconds up to 8, 10, 12 minutes, mm-hmm. I don't feel the way that I just felt. Right. Like, boom, gone, right? I feel a completely different way. Not always so easy to see unless we do this, right, for family members. I'm so afraid, you know, and if you're sitting out there listening and you identify with this, um, you know, every time I hear a siren, I think, oh, my God, my my son or my daughter's in the back of that. Right. Every time, uh, you know, I'm sitting around wait. every time the phone rings at midnight. Oh, my God, it's uh, the hospital or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're in that, that is, you know, that powerlessness and that then that fear really is um, so debilitating and so hard that we will participate in very unhealthy behaviors, putting putting trackers on our on our loved ones phones, chasing them around, kicking down drug dealers doors, putting ourselves in dangerous situations, um, yelling and bargaining and and um, and, uh, you know, passive aggressive behavior, slamming doors. But everything's fine here or complete with treat. With, withdrawal, yeah, yeah. retreating from Yeah, everything. retreating completely, shutting down, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, I don't have to feel that fear that I'm feeling. And so, you know, that's an example of what we're talking about is I don't want to feel the way that I feel. If, I, if I'm in a spot where those feelings become so overwhelming that it feels that my brain thinks if you don't change the way that you feel, something worse than death is going to happen. And if in the, at, at that time I introduce uh, an addictive behavior or substance, that is the formula for addiction right there. That's exactly right. Because there's one thing that drugs and process addictions have in common is that they will take us out of that feeling right now. It, it's a dopamine spike. And as soon as my brain has enough dopamine, everything in my brain that was all seized up, let's go and goes, <gasps> ah, Everything's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just for a moment. And then our brain locks onto that and it says what That my, is the answer. Yeah. I remember, you know, I look back and I remember that first time, you know, um, when I was a kid doing drugs. And it was almost like from this perspective, looking back, my brain stopped. Everything stopped. And my brain said to me, Bob, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what you just did, but whatever it is, it's going to be the most important thing that you ever do in your life from this point forward. Now, of course, you don't know that that's happening at the time. But looking back, all of a sudden, everything changed. Right. Everything. My friends changed. My music changed. My school habits changed. My, my attitude changed. Everything changed. Everything revolves moment. around yeah. this new thing. Yeah. And so it is really important for us to be able to, to a, when we come back from this break, to, to A, talk about identifying our feelings mm-hmm. and to talk about why, we need, why it's important for us to identify our feelings um, so that we can step back and learn new habits so we're not caught up in these addictive behaviors. Brenda Way, MFT, in studio with me today. I'm Bob Sheritz, and this is the Way Out Recovery Hour. We will be right back. 
Welcome back to the Way Out Recovery Hour. If you are just joining us, um, take the time to go back and watch the last segment of this video. Uh, Brenda and I sort of opened up and, and talked about different feelings and emotions and, um, and why they are healthy and why they are uh, necessary and we're supposed to have them. They're not good or bad. They just are. Um, you know, in the world of addiction, whether it's process addiction or substance addictions, the commonality is that we don't want to feel the way that we're feeling right now. And if we're at a time when those feelings can be uh, perceived by the brain as overwhelming and we introduce an addictive behavior, that addictive behavior excuse me, whether it's process or substance, that addictive behavior can become pathological very, very quickly. It can become problematic. It can become addictive um, because, you know, the uh, one of the things that those behaviors and substances do is they produce large amounts of neurotransmitters, which knock down the stress level, which makes us feel like we're not in that overwhelming, uh, makes us think we're not in that overwhelming emotion and takes the feelings down. The problem with that is, I'm going to say to you, Brenda, selective numbing. So we're numbing out with a drug, right? I don't want to feel this way. I'm just going to check out or I'm numbing out with a behavior. I don't want to feel this way. Can I selectively numb just one feeling? I don't want to feel the bad stuff. I cannot selectively numb. Yeah. And it's that's possible. And that's the difficulty with it is that the longer that we participate in those things, so we can't selectively numb our feelings. So when we numb, we numb ev all, all affect, right? All we them. numb everything. And makes um, it that much more scary when we do experience it. Well, it can certainly, yeah, and then it gets all mixed up, and then, so what happens? And you may, you know, you may have heard this, right? When I come into the recovery process, for me personally, I got sober at the age of thirty-seven. I started using drugs when I was ten years old. Emotionally speaking, on some level, at thirty-seven, and I'm, I'm going to make a little joke, but I don't like to make light. Probably now, as well, at fifty, <laughs> you know, I'm a ten-year-old emotionally. And maybe even, and I'm going to, no, I'm going to say for sure even younger than that emotionally. Because our brains don't necessarily um, um, develop in a healthy manner and our emotions don't develop in a healthy manner inside of trauma and abuse and neglect and the households that some of us grew up in either. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that arrested development probably started for me before 10 years old. Well. If I can interject, what you're talking about is if I've grown up with trauma or with any kind of chaos, my brain creates a template of what the world looks like. Whether it's actually what the world is or not, my brain says this is how everything is. So an example, it makes a story like it's not like like I might say um, – uh, if I was hurt or traumatized at a very young age, I'd say seven. That's for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can't ever trust anybody again. Right. Like that's an example. Everyone right? is dangerous. They could all right. hurt me again. Right. So, um, so why is that necessarily not healthy for me to build that story? It seems almost protective to me, but is it overly? It's protective, but it is overly because the fact is that you and I sitting here now, right now, know not everyone is going to hurt us. But it's that template that says, but they might. Right. So there's always this part of me. Oh, so no wonder I've spent the entirety of my life never really, really being able to get close to somebody. Right. It, it stamps our perception and it gets us stuck into this one single mold. And if everyone is potentially dangerous, then my predominant feeling is usually going to be fear. And all of my other emotions might get based around fear and anything I feel will come back to that poke fear. Right. This is scary. So, so what that might translate into is now that I'm, now that I'm experiencing life and I've had those kind of experiences, which, um, which change the way that I perceive my feelings, they have a big story around them. Now, when I feel happy, I might feel, um, like you were describing earlier. Yeah, this happiness is going to be fleeting and I'm mm -hmm. sure the other shoe is going to drop. Right. 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 So in, so 
so we may not be able to even identify or know what we are feeling early in the recovery process. Absolutely. So that is the purpose of, and that's why it is so important for us to do work around identifying what my feelings are so that I know what I'm feeling. I can act appropriately and I'm not dragging in a lifetime worth of unresolved stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's something that we talked about earlier is uh, frequently I'll sit with a client and they'll tell me what's going on in their life. And I'll say, how do you feel right now? And, and they'll say, well, I don't think my boss should have done that. I say, okay, that's what you think. But what do you feel? And they'll say, well, I feel like he doesn't respect me. So, so we start building an emotional vocabulary, right? We get to the five basic emotions and we'll build a vocabulary from them. Because I'll say, do you feel angry? Well, no, I don't feel angry. Okay, how about irritated? Yeah, I feel irritated. Not registering the irritation is a form of anger. So we've got to be able to have that awareness of what emotions are before just to start talking them. about them so right. so here's a little trick we're we're getting to the end of our show but here's a little trick do me a favor brennan put your hand on your chest all right those of you at home put your hand on your chest and just say out loud i feel sad i feel happy oh i'm sorry i sad. feel angry <laughs> i feel, I feel whatever i feel yes. right the reason I put your hand on your chest is because that's where feelings come from. Yeah. And we need to be able to separate and identify what's a feeling and what's a thought, right? Mm -hmm. So we have about two minutes. How do I know if I'm sad? What, what, how do I know if I'm sad? This is going to be real simple, right? How do I know if I'm sad? How can I identify if sadness is involved? It's a Wow, you know what? All of a sudden, I feel stumped. How do I know if I'm sad, Bob? Well, I get a, I get a, maybe my throat locks up a little bit. I get tearful in my eyes, right? Yeah. It's a physical sensation that yes. I have. Yes, it's a collection of symptoms. How do I know when I'm mad? I, I flush. Yeah. And my muscles get tense. Maybe I clench my fist. Uh -huh. Maybe I, what I do, if anybody can see this, is I get my, my legs starts bouncing uh, yeah. on me, right? <laughs> right. How do I know if I'm glad? My corners of my <laughs> mouth want to pull up. Right? I'm smiling. Mm -hmm. I feel good. I feel light. I feel elated, right? How do I know if I'm afraid? What's interesting is about the fear. It feels a lot like the anger for me. Right. I feel flushed. My muscles get tight. And my stomach starts to flutter. My heart beats too fast. Yeah. And which is a lot like shame as well. That's right. You know, I get that warm flush, right? right. And I don't know exactly what's going on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer this, and maybe this is a good place for us to end, just as a, as a tool. I, I know that anger gets us in a lot of trouble, and maybe that's the one that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. So I want to offer this to everybody as we leave. First, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. I love you. Love you, Bob. And what a wonderful show we had. Um, we are going to do Feelings Part 2 next month. Let's Perfect. do it. And um, if you struggle with anger, before you act on, on it, before you cuss somebody out or you, you know, chase them down or you cut them off or you whatever, I want you to stop everything that you're doing. Take a step away from your situation and ask yourself, what am I afraid of? If I struggle with anger issues, generally speaking, I'm either ashamed or afraid. And if I'm ashamed, I'm probably afraid too, because shame really is, I'm scared of what you think of Absolutely. me. Absolutely. And so if you so struggle with anger issues, ask yourself, what am I afraid of? I'm Bob Sheritz. This is the Way Out Recovery Hour. Brenda Way, thank you very much. We will see everyone next week. Take it easy.